Hey everybody, thanks for checking this out. I'm finally recording a video on my stupid pet tricks project, um, also known as how to turn your 1977 2001 series pet into a killer game machine. I'm gonna quickly go through some uh, history of the pet computers, quickly through the refurbishment of this machine, and then finally get into the project where I add sound support and joystick support and play some games on this uh, vintage pet computer. And I'll put links down below to the different sections if you want to skip ahead. So the history of the pet machine, uh, it was uh, Commodore's first computer. It came out in 1977. Uh, Byte Magazine talked about the Trinity in 1977, um, the Commodore pet, the Apple II, and the original TRS-80. It was the first time someone could walk into a store, buy a computer, take it home, set it up, and be going right away. So it was really the birth of the home computer market. What's interesting to me is the PET and the TRS-80 were going for this serious computer. It had a built-in monitor, had fixed characters, so no uh, accommodations for graphics, no sound. And the Apple II had some color, had sound, was made to hook up to your TV at home, was uh, presented with game controllers. So it was really interesting to me that that's where Commodore started and where Apple started. And just a few years later, you know, Commodore is dominating the home computer market with the VIC-20 and then the C64, and Apple's going the exact opposite direction with the Macintosh and the all-in-one included monochromatic display. In my opinion, this computer is just a beautiful representation of the late 70s futuristic design. They called it the 2001 series. It seems like it was pretty obviously influenced by the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, the trapezoidal display, the future of everything is white. Even the uh, font that uh, Commodore used is used heavily in that movie. Even from the side, it has cool lines. And I always thought this machine was like uh, pretty big until I saw them in real life. And uh, you know, if you compare them, this is, this is the beginning of the 8-bit computer market. This was the end, the Commodore 128. Just barely a little bit wider than the 128, this pet computer. And if we look at it on from a side view, obviously it's deeper, the pet's deeper, but if you put a big monitor in front of this uh, Commodore 128, you're really going to take up uh, even more desk space. So, uh, in fact, these computers are actually kind of uh, smaller than they look. All right, let's open it up and look inside and have a quick discussion on the repairs that went on. Uh, these original pets are all metal construction. Uh, Commodore reportedly or did make office furniture, so they reportedly had their office furniture division make the cases for this. They were also famously making calculators right before computers, so it seems like they had their calculator supplier supply the keypad. They got a uh, Criticized for this in the press and uh, quickly change this in the next iterations So these computers just open up like this Have a little kickstand that comes down So we'll take a look inside so There's the one big circuit board here with the main computer on it uh, It's got the stamp right there or the text right there 1977 version. So this is the original version of the motherboard it's got the 6550 RAM in the front here, and those are very prone to failure. Um, the original owner was so proud of this, he uh, put his name, etc., in here. So when I got this machine, it didn't boot. Um, I reseeded all the chips, um, got it to boot to 1K, and swapped the RAM chips until I could find the bad RAM chips, replace those. Finally got it to boot all the way to 8K. There was a large fan mounted back here. I removed that and uh, installed a uh, externally powered fan back there. There was a 
transformer mounted in here and I think that was used for the uh, sound module and we'll be talking about that later and on the user port um, this connector was on there obviously for CB2 sound but also for uh, other IO has been connected to this machine over time so internally it was mostly reseeding chips and replacing RAM chips um, the tape drive had a belt in it that was dry rotted, so I replaced that. I cleaned the uh, keyboard, took disassembled it, cleaned the contacts on the keyboard, and cleaned up, of course, the whole machine cosmetically. And this blue bezel was really faded, so I used this uh, Aerospace Protectant 303 on it. Uh, really uh, refurbished the blue and brought out the nice color again. And really the uh, repair that drove me the craziest was this sticker here. Had a uh, part that was sticking up in the corner. I tried all these different techniques I saw online. Uh, reheating it to reactivate the adhesive, cleaning off the back of the adhesive with uh, other sticky tape to clean it off, adding uh, warm water. Nothing could get this corner to stick down. Uh, so I finally used a little dab of super glue. Now it's it looks pretty good. I'm not going to adjust it from here. So I bought this machine on eBay. I jumped on it quickly and I guess I didn't read the uh, description that well. I did know it needed some, uh, some work, but to my surprise, when I opened the front door and I heard the package was there, I had this, a Commodore package on my front porch in this day and age. It was totally awesome. Walk out of my front porch, see this, Commodore branded box, the pet logo on it, uh, totally cool. Let's see if we turn it around. You can see model 2001-4, so that's a 4K version, 2001-8 AK version, um, and the serial number. This guy's name is uh, all over the box. Turns out he's the original owner. He ordered it straight from Commodore. Uh, now I'm the second owner of it. Just really cool to get it in the Commodore box. So I'll show you one other thing in here. It even included the original foam inserts that uh, hold the Commodore PET. So the Commodore PET was protected by this foam from 1978. Pretty amazing that it was all still here. So also in the box were a lot of great things. The uh, original PET user manual. Congratulations on packing and turning on your pet. I like this, the boot screen with 4K and 8K. Uh, rumored that they've made very few of these 4K ones. How to use the keyboard, etc. Pet communications with the outside world. So this kind of uh, introduces the new pet owner to the interfaces on the, on the computer and how to hook it up to other things, to peripherals. Talks about the IEEE port, but this machine I have is revision one, uh, the original revision. It does not support the IEEE port uh, with that revision of the ROMs. Squiggle and big time tape, uh, this came with the uh, with the original machines. And then on this side was a, uh, whoops, machine language monitor. This is really cool. Uh, all of his tapes um, from back in the day. And then this was really cool. This is Cursor Magazine, which was a tape magazine all the way from uh, July of 1978, issue one to issue 30, which I think is the last one, which was in 1982. So he had all the tapes, and then he had this binder, had all of the flyers that came with all of the tapes. Really, really cool. So uh, here in issue three, September 78, it talks about the CB2 sound, and I'll show that in a minute. I implemented that. Let's see what else do I have marked here. 
Yeah, here's the uh, last issue, Cursor 30. I think it's the last issue. They talk about the uh, C64 is going to come out later this year, uh, priced at $5.95. Uh, this is funny. They uh, say Commodore will release its own 16-bit microprocessor chip in early of 1983. Cost only $6, according to the usually reliable source. Of course, we know that never happened. Um, so this is really cool. And then the final thing in here, uh, previous owner went through and listed all of the programs in the cursor tapes whether they have support sound or not, whether they use, he said the joystick, but he was talking about the number pad on the uh, keyboard and not. Uh, really, really cool. And then the last thing that was in there was really cool and led to more of the project. Uh, two Pet User Club newsletters. Volume 1, Issue 1 from 1979. Um, uh, this one's uh, pretty darn cool. And then Volume 1, Issue 2 from 1979 also. Again, a lot of like cool historical articles in here. Um, but the one that really caught my eye was this one here. Pet and the Dual Joysticks by Chuck Johnson of Sphinx. So this guy has an article in here about how to hook up dual joysticks to the PET 2001. Uh, talks about how to hook them up to the user port. Um, so I saw this and I was like, I want to do that project. Okay, that's what came in the box. Okay, I got the PET back up on the table. I think we can finally get into the project portion of this video. Um, I said earlier that I replaced the belt on this uh, data set, and that did get it to work, uh, but it's not real reliable. Maybe 25% of the time it can load a tape. I probably need to take it out and do an alignment on it. But I also had the big issue of getting software off the internet and onto this machine. You know, there's possibly ways to do it through the C64 and save it on a cassette, but it was really difficult. So uh, I didn't want to update the ROMs on this. This has the original ROMs on it. I wanted to keep it fully original. Um, and it does not support the IEEE floppy drives. So what I decided to do was build a Tapino. So this is what I built. This is a uh, Tapino. Hopefully I'm saying that right. So I can put programs on an SD card, plug it in here, loaded in through the cassette interface. So I had fun with this front label, called it a digital data set, model DC2N. So I'll try to take this cover off and show you my construction here. It's just actually a piece of cardboard here that covers what's going on. All right, got it out. Okay, you can see it's pretty DIY. Uh, I got an LCD up there, this board with a bunch of wires soldered on it, and these uh, four buttons. So I followed the design of the Tapuino, um, glued some blocks in there, screwed this uh, proto board on there. Uh, obviously, I've got a uh, SD card reader in the bottom of this, and lo and behold, it actually works. So I'll put this cover back on. And yes, it's just a cardboard box that I, red cardboard box that I painted white. Now I'm chipping the paint. Okay. So next I uh, implemented the CB2 sound for the pet. Um, be a link below for plans to do that. Initially, I did it very simply right off the user port connector with some piezo speakers. It was very, very light. So in the end, I finally built this. And uh, if we look at this section here, <laughs> not pretty, but I've got uh, this little three and a half millimeter jack hooked up to the CB2 with a resistor there. So now I can plug PC speakers in here and uh, use their own amplification and it works very, very well. 
So this is the dual joystick that I showed in the pet user group newsletter. It's very ingenious. They didn't have enough I.O. to bring in two joysticks directly up, down, left and right and fire five switch closures per. So what they did is they used diodes here and when you push the fire button, it is actually grounding up and down at the same time. So your software has to be uh, aware of that. And if you want to interpret the fire button, you have to look for up and down both at the same time. With traditional joysticks, obviously that's mechanically impossible to do. So uh, via software, you can detect that. Obviously you now cannot detect that I'm pushing up and fire at the same time or down and fire or, or no direction, no up or down and fire. So it has limitations, but it was a way for them to get around it and get all uh, signals in here. So once I got this built, I tested it with the basic program. These two joysticks worked uh, great. They were spitting out the data code correctly. The sound was great for with uh, programs with sound. And so then I went to look for the snake program that was uh, referenced in the uh, pet user group newsletter and I couldn't find it. I couldn't find any software out there that used these two uh, joystick ports paradigm. But I did find a great game on Bo Zimmerman's site, Cosmoids, and it had yet a different joystick pin out. So I implemented that here and uh, this one with a simple poke before you ran the program uh, supported sound and joystick. So I'm going to demo that right now. Okay, I got the machine turned around. You can see the uh, digital data set uh, coming out of this hole that somebody had cut in the machine years ago for the big fan. I got a new fan just zip tied on here and it's running off a 5 volt transformer uh, USB uh, connection style. So here is the uh, interface. First, I'm going to take a regular joystick, plug it into the that joystick port. I've got these uh, cheap speakers from an uh, old Dell PC. So I'm going to bring the audio connection, plug it in here. And this all plugs into the user port. These speakers are powered by USB. The fan luckily has a spare USB port here. So we got everything connected up and powered up. So I'll turn it back around and we'll uh, load the game. Okay, I got everything hooked up. Uh, starting to look like an 80s computer with a bunch of wires here. Uh, turn her on and uh, see how it goes. Good, 7167 bytes free. I always look at that. I had so many problems with RAM in this machine. Uh, the Tapino is ready to go. So I am gonna type load. Uh, and you don't have to specify, it just assumes it's a cassette deck. And this is a booter program that's loading that actually does the poke for us, sets it up, and then loads the rest of the program. This digital data set goes at the exact same speed as the cassette deck, so it's very slow. We list this program. Uh, yeah, so I wrote this program, just uh, booted into joystick mode. So Cosmide is loading. Uh, once it gets loaded, it's going to do these two poke commands that are to enable the joystick and then run the game. All right, here's the game's loaded. Got the joystick hooked up. 
it tells you the uh, keyboard uh, keys here to play, but uh, it also supports a joystick. Let's hit S and start this game. Okay, as you can see, it's kind of a uh, Galga type game. Just really, really well implemented with the uh, fixed character set, the Petsky character set on the uh, Commodore computers. Those enemies are jumping from one character spacing to the next, but the way they programmed it, uh, they really look fluid. The guy got me stuck in the corner, didn't he? The twinkling stars, nice touch. And then the sound. You know, the pet did not have any sound to begin with, did not have a joystick to begin with. So, um, you know, the community figured out a way to hook up the uh, CB2 sound, they call it. And this game loop must be uh, adjusting those frequencies of that sound and maintaining that sound the whole time. See that guy dove down and then back up? I'm almost out of fuel. All right, this is the end of the level boss. You got to shoot in his mouth, which is weird, but that's what you're supposed to do. Got him. So the game's good. It even ramps up the difficulty. Uh, wave two, up to two guys will dive at you. They'll start shooting diagonally at you. Just, <laughs> just amazingly well implemented game. Oh, he got me with a diagonal shot, didn't he? Game over. Just really a great game with the limitations of the system. Um, did not initially have sound or joystick support. Community said, let's figure out a way to do it. All right, I'm going to demo the second game. Let's turn the computer back on. 7167, that's good. Um, so I'll type load. So we're loading a game called Galaxy Invaders. This was usually traded under the name spaceinvade.prg. Uh, I pulled that down off the internet, uh, modified it so that it works with the joystick, and also uh, looked at the bootloader, the basic bootloader on it, and it had this name Galaxy Invaders in there, um, but it did not display that name because the save state of the game had a high score in it, and when the save state had a score in it, it didn't show the name of the game. So I was able to clear out that place in memory, so it now presents the original name of the game when you boot it, and uh, supports the joystick, just like uh, the same joystick paradigm that the previous game used. Takes quite a while to load this. All right, it's done loading. Let's list this. So it's got quite the uh, basic uh, front-end program, but uh, of course it's using assembler code after that. We'll run this. Galaxy Invaders. Joystick update by me. Um, B to begin the game. Return. So it actually works with the joystick. You can see the uh, enemies here, the uh, Space Invader type enemies, have pixel perfect movement. That's because they're using the Petsky uh, block characters that you can stack next to each other and get single pixel movement. 
Um, Robin did a uh, cool video on this recently. I'll link to that. So this game was uh, designed to be used and played with the uh, chiclet keyboard. Um, and it was, you know, pretty playable there, but uh, obviously using a joystick makes it much more natural. And you can see when the uh, Space Invaders get hit, their explosion has to be in a uh, character space cell because the explosion is like an X. Missed him. So this game's kind of crazy with the number of options it has in the beginning. Uh, the number of men you get, I have 19 people remaining. Um, but then the difficulty ramps up really quickly and pretty soon these waves, there's just like hardly any way to clear them out. It is interesting, they even have a collision between the uh, bullets from the enemy and uh, myself. So that's Galaxy. <laughs> so that's Galaxy Invaders for the Commodore Pet, uh, modified to work with the uh, single joystick interface. Okay, the last game I have here uses dual joysticks. So remember, I made that uh, dual joystick scenario from the uh, Commodore User Group magazine. I really wanted a program to be able to use the dual joysticks and I couldn't find any anywhere on the internet. So I found a really good version of Pong uh, from Cursor Magazine and it was designed to use the little chiclet keyboard, which would have just been horrible, right? So I modified it so that it can use the dual joysticks. So let's load that up. All right, it's done loading. Let's list this, see what it says. L, shift I, short hand for list. So there's quite a decent basic program that runs this, but uh, there is machine language in the background that uh, helps it with uh, speed and uh, running this thing. So we'll run this and I have my daughter here. She's going to help play this game. So we have competition. Pong cursor number 29. So this is the second to last cursor magazine. If I have that correct, joysticks by Jim to 2019 press return to begin. Who's player on the left? That will be me. Who's the player on the right? Ella. And so this game actually has tennis, squash, hockey, and practice. So we'll play tennis, just the normal skill level. Uh, let's go beginner. Otherwise, uh, it's actually pretty fast. All right. Oh, no. <laughs> Come on, Ella. This is the first time I've ever played on here, so. All right, good job. Thank you. So the joysticks really work for this game. Uh, it's a really good two-player game. It's a, a really good implementation of Pong for the Commodore Pet. Again, they don't have a graphics mode, so this is all character graphics uh, that they drew the whole screen with. 
use the sound and now it works with joystick oh i missed it ella is coming back my apple watch skills coming handy Oh, I was going to try to put some English on it. So there it is. A really good implementation of Pong on the Commodore Pet. Now operates with dual joysticks. Hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> Yay, Jim wins. Do you want to play a different game? Sure. Like the squash or whatever? Squash is hard. Uh, then, but and you want to play intermediate? So it'll be faster? Sure. Oh, so I don't know who goes first. Yeah. So try to hit it. Oh. oh, it was your turn to hit it. <laughs> I don't know whose turn it is to hit it. It's your turn right now. Since you sure? It was your turn again. So if I miss it, I have to go again. Yes, apparently. Oh my gosh. Don't you know how squash works? No, I don't. Are you now? It's it. now. It's my turn to hit it. <laughs> it goes through. Apparently. <laughs> now it's your turn to hit it. You're in... Good job. Ooh. Mine's slightly harder because I have to hit it before you do. Well, I also didn't know how to play, and so <laughs> just extra points that we get. So. No. <laughs> the paddles are shorter in squash than tennis, aren't they? I think so. Okay. Good job. Uh, I'm so proud of myself. I'm proud of myself too. You shouldn't be. I'm terrible at this. <laughs> so that bouncing ball is made up of the uh, character graphics. And it has to take a whole character space to draw that ball. And uh, that doesn't, in a black background, that doesn't matter. But when it goes through the center line or through the uh, front paddle, you can see that uh, whole border around that, around that pixel because it's the whole character that has to be illuminated there. I was explaining stuff. Keep doing that. Poorly. <laughs> yeah, you should just explain everything. <laughs> All right, that's squash. Okay, everybody. Those were the three games that I got working with the two different joystick paradigms that I implemented. I did even find yet a different uh, joystick uh, design. This is Pet User Group Newsletter, Volume 0, Number 3. University of California, Berkeley is where it's from. There's no date on the front of this, but it was mailed in September 78. And really interestingly, there's a letter from Commodore, April 14th, 78, from John Fegans asking uh, this group for any input on the revision to the pet coming up. Um, but why I'm bringing this up, not only is that interesting, but there's yet another Atari joystick interface design in this. I also found the game Scramble, a uh, version of it that says it supports joysticks, and it's yet a different paradigm. So it's clear that people were interfacing joysticks to these pet computers, uh, but no standard really emerged for the joystick. Uh, for the sound, the CB2 standard did become a standard. Uh, the joystick, it seemed like, uh, never really settled on a standard. Okay, so that wraps up this project. Uh, look below for further links and further details. Please leave any kind of feedback below. And if anybody can find that snake game, the one that Chuck Johnson mentions in that dual joystick article that I implemented, Chuck Johnson of Sphinx, 
please let me know. I'd love to play that with the dual joysticks that were implemented here. Also, if there's any other games that you know of that really call for a joystick, games that would run on the PET 2001 8K machine with the original BASIC, uh, leave that below. Uh, maybe I can do a follow-up video of hacking that and uh, adding joystick support and playing yet a different game. I really enjoyed working on this project. Hope you enjoyed the video too. Thanks everybody. See you later. Bye.